All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the department. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first Grand Rounds of the year. As you will hear, we always kick off Grand Rounds with the Norman Kretschmer Endowed Lectureship and our visiting professor. Um, but before that, I just want to attend to a few matters. Uh, first, of course, is the Stanford University Land Acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that San Francisco on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, and very, very uh, grateful to be able to make that land acknowledgement. And then as always for Grand Rounds, we just call your attention to some of our upcoming speakers. This is a really, really wonderful lineup. Um, we'll hear from Dr. Nichols in just a moment, but very pleased to have Joyce Sackey joining us. She is Stanford's first Chief Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Officer for all of Stanford Medicine. And she's gonna be speaking with us about advancing health equity, supporting good intentions with measurement and accountability. And I hope you know that both hospitals right now are in the process of the search for the chief health equity officer and that person will report in our case to grace lee and to joyce and that's just been a wonderful partnership and then also really delighted um, that we'll be welcoming dr arbor um, to give pediatric grand rounds and she in recognition of woman in medicine month and she's a primary care physician at brigham and women's hospital she leads their social care team that is responsible for addressing social determinants of health in 14 primary care practices. She implements and evaluates interventions to promote maternal and child health and reduce inequities in the US and abroad. So I think you can see what a wonderful uh, theme we have lined up for this month. Um, and with that, uh, a couple other announcements. I wanna make sure everybody knows about the upcoming Maternal and Child Health Research Institute seminars. Um, and we're gonna be hearing from Ananta and Maya about increasing diverse representation in maternal and child health studies. And then from Anisha and Dong Mei on principles of community engaged research. This has been a big push with CHRI in our early, in the last few years, we focused on clinical research support for being, people doing research within the walls of our hospital for children that have a medical record with us. But now the next push is we get out into the community um, is much, much broader engagement. And um, this whole team here really is helping lead the way with toolkits and very practical advice. And so I think people will find these seminars uh, really incredibly helpful. Um, and then also we're uh, coming up on the annual uh, Maternal and Child Health Research Institute Symposium. Each year we have a theme with very distinguished speakers. And this year the, the theme is climate induced change and maternal and child health. You can see the line up here, but we'll be addressing a number of other topics. Uh, and today is the deadline for the abstract submission. Um, we have well over a hundred abstracts submitted and it's looking to be a really wonderful event and hope you all will join us then. So with that, I get to tell you a little bit about Dr. Kretschmer. Now, Phil Sunshine has shepherd, shepherded this endowed professorship since its inception. And last night was able to give us a really colorful history about who Dr. Kretschmer was. I'll just tell you a few of the high points. So Dr. Kretschmer was born in New York and attended Cornell University, got his BS degree in animal physiology in 1944, got a PhD in physiologic chemistry at the University of Minnesota and his MD at the State University of New York in 1952. He chose to pursue basic science research in pediatric nutrition. And his first academic appointment was as an associate professor of biochemistry in the Department of Pediatrics at Cornell. In those early years, he really gained widespread recognition for his expertise in the metabolism of lactic acid, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. In 1959, he was appointed chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford. Dr. Sunshine told us last night there were six faculty in the department at that time. And I think that over Dr. Kretschmer's tenure, it grew to 40 faculty. I'll just mention that we're well over 400 now. Um, during his 15 years as chair, he built the department, built its reputation and continued his research interest in prenatal infant and child nutrition with an emphasis on the biology of intestinal enzymes. One of his major achievements at Stanford was that he guided the foundation of the innovative interdepartmental program in human biology. Many of you will know that HumBio was the most popular major across the Stanford campus for many, many years before it was surpassed by um, computer science, but still HumBio is an incredibly important program. Um, and Dr. Kreshmer was the chair of the program from 1969 to 1974. Then in 1974, he was selected to be the director of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Bethesda, um, served in this position for seven years. And I'm sure you all know that this is the only NIH Institute without specific disease orientation, but has a very, very broad mandate covering child health. He also served as president of the American Pediatric Society, was a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and was a fellow of the American Institute of Nutrition. 
He was a senior member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine and served as the editor in chief of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the world's largest and premier nutrition journal. So the Kretschmer Lecture is a very, very special event here in the department. And with that, we have a very, very special visiting Kretschmer professor. Um, and so my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Nichols, who's President uh, Emeritus and CEO of, uh, Emeritus of the American Board of Pediatrics. He earned his BA in Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry from Yale, did his MD with honors in Mount Sinai, and then completed his pediatric residency and chief residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an anesthesiology residency at UPenn before he did his fellowship at CHOP in pediatric critical care. He then went to Johns Hopkins, where he was director of the pediatric ICU division chief and professor of pedi pediatric anesthesiology and critical care medicine. I'm told he trained 80 fellows, some of whom are in this room. Um, so it's been really fun for everybody to catch up with Dr. Nichols. And he was the Mary Wallace Stanton professor and vice dean for education. And I learned he chaired the search committee that appointed Dean Minor as the chair of EMT at Hopkins. Um, during his times at Hopkins, he was credited with establishing the Genes to Society curriculum, which is notable for its system approach to a broad, all-encompassing understanding of the human being, including genes, molecules, cells, and organs of the patient, to the familial, community, societal, and environmental elements that can affect patient health. During his tenure as president and CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics, he catalyzed collaborative quality improvement networks and fostered partnerships with patients and families to improve health outcomes and address health disparities. When he stepped down from the American Board of Pediatrics, two awards were created in his honor. The National Medical Association Award will fund an educational session for pediatricians at their annual convention. And it was my profound pleasure just in the year that I was serving as president of APS was the year that the American Board of Pediatrics Foundation came to APS with an endowment to establish the David G. Nichols Health Equity Award. This is an endowed award that is presented now at PAS to recognize an individual or group who has demonstrated excellence in advancing child and adolescent health, well-being and equity through quality improvement, advocacy, practice, or research. And not surprisingly, Dr. Nichols was the inaugural recipient of the Nichols Award. And then um, part of receiving that award is you then serve on the selection committee. Um, and I think Dr. Nichols can attest the extraordinary slate of candidates that came through last year. And Nadine Burke Harris, an alumni of our residency, um, is the recipient of the award. Now, we created a committee at APS to be very thoughtful and very careful about what were the eligibility criteria, what were the selection, the review criteria. And we asked Dr. Nichols to join us in one of those deliberations. Um, and I would say he fervently challenged us to strive towards a 10-year goal of eliminating disparities in the delivery of health care to children. And shortly after that meeting, we were um, inspired. Um, the, the group of us on the APS Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as APS leadership, wrote a paper in pediatric research entitled Achieving Equity Through Science and Integrity, Dismantling Race-Based Medicine. And I encourage all of you to read that. And it opens talking about how we were inspired by Dr. Nichols and really emphasize the vital importance of science and integrity in unraveling the structural and systemic inequalities that inequities that have contributed to pervasive disparities in care and outcomes. And I think, Dr. Nichols, you can see, perhaps by some of the speakers I've told you are lined up for the month, how that's such a driving passion for the Department of Pediatrics. And we couldn't be more pleased to have you here as the Kretschmer Lecture. And I will just say we have this, this <laughs> for you. So welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Leonard, and good morning, everyone. It's a real honor for me to be here. I'm going to switch over the slides, hopefully, and get my presentation powered up. Um, Dr. Kretschmer is a towering figure, and I'm, I'm humbled uh, to stand before you in the named uh, lectureship. Um, his legacy is uh, more than I even expected. Um, Dr. Sunshine was very kind in, in explaining all of that last night. Well, I'm going to talk about advancing child health in the midst of crisis. I have uh, no financial disclosures, but I do have a disclaimer. Uh, this presentation uh, reflects my views uh, only and does not reflect the official policy positions of the American Board of Pediatrics or any other organization. 
I'll give you uh, the traditional learning objectives in a minute, but uh, you can think of my talk today as a play in three acts. Uh, act one is going to be a very brief history of our profession of pediatrics uh, to try to explain how pediatricians have navigated over the years to adapt to the needs of children. And then in act two, I'm going to talk about today's crises and try to analyze how the healthcare system is failing many children, particularly in the areas of mental health and healthcare disparities. As I go along, I'm going to assume my share of the uh, responsibility. Uh, I am one of 80,000 board certified pediatricians uh, in the United States, uh, but I have played a role in some of these issues and will acknowledge them uh, as we continue this discussion. And then in Act 3, I will propose uh, solutions, um, structural solutions, I hope, uh, namely in the areas of quality improvement and a learning health system for the disparities issue uh, and in competency-based medical education for the mental health issue. So let's dive into Act 1, our history, very briefly. The history of pediatrics in the United States begins with this man, Abraham Jacoby, uh, who in 1861 becomes the first chair of the Department of Children's Diseases in the United States. Uh, this was at the New York Medical College. Now, the social uh, and historical context of Dr. Jacoby's life is uh, relevant to some of the issues we're dealing with today. Uh, he grew up in poverty as the child of uh, Jewish shopkeepers uh, in Hartum, Germany. Uh, after being imprisoned for revolutionary activity while a medical student, he escaped first to the United Kingdom and then to the United States as a penniless uh, immigrant. The issues of the day were malnutrition, childhood poverty, in part due to massive immigration, including unaccompanied minors and infectious diseases, of course. He made significant contributions in all these areas, including opening a free clinic at the Lower East Side of Manhattan where he precepted students. He invented indirect laryngoscopy in order to visualize the diphtheritic pseudomembrane. However, for today's discussion, I am highlighting his service on the board of the Nursery and Child Hospital of New York. Uh, it was a women's and children's hospital combined with a foundling and foster home. Ahead of his time, uh, Jacoby collected data to show that the mortality rates for institutionalized children were significantly higher than for children living in families, uh, even families in poverty. His persistent efforts uh, to keep children out of institutions earned him a request from the president of the hospital to resign. Uh, he refused. Uh, he said, you can fire me. He stood on his data. We will come back to these issues of the interaction of leadership uh, and data uh, and the issues of child well-being. Now I'm taking you to the middle years, uh, which uh, occurred roughly from the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, the images on this slide uh, show you some of the milestones of these middle years, beginning perhaps with the first uh, neonatal intensive care unit, at the Yale New Haven Hospital, later bone marrow transplantation units uh, appeared as childhood cancers became curable. And on the right, uh, you can see what a PICU started to look like in the 1990s. Uh, the competencies remained medical knowledge, patient care, and professionalism, but medical knowledge was recognized to be a lifelong endeavor. Now, it's during these years that subspecialization overtook pediatrics. 
Uh, you can see that subspecialty certification began uh, with pediatric cardiology in 1961 and extended through other uh, subspecialties over the next 40 years. These were primarily organ-based or geographic unit-based subspecialties in pediatrics. Pediatricians uh, in these subspecialties have been enormously successful in converting life-ending diseases into chronic diseases. But with that conversion, we will see in a bit how the needs of families have evolved as well. Now, to keep pace uh, with changes in society and uh, in the healthcare system, the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education, or ACGME, and the certifying boards broaden the concept of what it means uh, to be a competent physician by adding three new competencies, practice-based learning and improvement, communications and systems-based practice. And while the last few years have seen stunning breakthroughs uh, in patient care uh, based on genomics and translational research, the National Academy of Medicine recognized that concepts like good patient care or even excellent patient care were too vague for the 21st century. They added the six domains of healthcare quality, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. Now notice uh, the subspecialties that the ABP recognized uh, in this most recent era. You could argue that uh, each of them is connected to care systems uh, rather than organ systems. Adolescent medicine uh, interacts uh, with the public health system. Developmental and behavioral pediatrics interacts with the school system. Child abuse pediatrics interacts with the legal system, and of course, hospital medicine interacts with hospital systems. Now let's start to look at the current crises and begin to understand how our systems are failing children, many children today. This slide is from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. It shows the life expectancy at birth as a function of per capita healthcare spending. For developed countries in the world, there's a curvilinear relationship uh, between uh, healthcare spending leading to longer life expectancies, except for the United States uh, as the outlier. The OACD has identified the causes, fragmentation of the healthcare system, inadequate investment in public health and primary care, uninsured population groups, gun violence, behavioral and mental health problems, and healthcare disparities. These problems are all interrelated, uh, but for purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to focus on disparities and mental health. Now, before I leave this slide, note uh, that the data are from 2015. The most recent OEC data show the United States in an even worse position, if that is imaginable, with life expectancy at birth having decreased to 76 years and per capita healthcare expenditures now approaching 12 to $13,000. Now, let's go back to an earlier slide where I showed you the core competencies. Aspirationally, all six ACGME core competencies carry equal weight. However, the emphasis in training and assessment and the impact on outcomes, both for physician competencies and uh, for patient outcomes, are decidedly unequal. Most of the focus has been on medical knowledge and patient care competencies. In com in comparison, systems-based practice has received the least emphasis. The mental health crisis is not only a medical knowledge or a patient care issue, it is very much a systems issue as well. Now, similarly, I showed you the National Academy of Medicine's quality domains as equally weighted. However, their impact has also been decidedly unequal. 
safety and effectiveness have received the most attention and success, whereas equity uh, has had virtually no effect on actual patient outcomes. Patient-centeredness, timeliness, and efficiency are somewhere in the middle. Inequity drives the underperformance of the U.S. healthcare system and will not be solved unless it is addressed at all levels, including residency and fellow training levels and including leadership levels. So let's get into a little bit more detail. We'll start with healthcare disparities. This um, is going to be in the next three slides, a review of disparities in my area of cardiac critical care. I promised you that I would take my share uh, of the responsibilities. I invite those of you who are in other pediatric subspecialties or in general pediatrics to review the data on disparities in your areas. Uh, this report is from Boniva et al., uh, published in circulation, and was the first large-scale report comparing outcomes from congenital heart disease by race. Uh, it's based on CDC data from the National Center of Healthcare Statistics, and it shows mortality from 1979 through 1997. You will note that the mortality rates have decreased for both black and white uh, infants over a 20 year paper uh, pe uh, period, but I quote from the paper, outcomes among blacks appear generally worse than among whites, regardless of outcome measure and type of heart defect. Moreover, the gap is not closing. The higher death rates among blacks cannot be explained by higher pre prevalence. Now, the blue box uh, at the bottom is a reference to the publication of the first edition of critical heart disease in infants and children. Uh, this was the first textbook on cardiac critical care uh, for which I was editor in chief. And it did not mention healthcare disparities uh, at all. So you might say the Boniva paper uh, was published over 20 years ago. Has anything changed uh, recently in an era of fetal diagnosis, tremendous surgical advances, and the creation of separate cardiac intensive care units? Uh, the answer to that question comes from Lopez and colleagues who published this paper in circulation uh, two years ago, three years ago now. Here I've simplified and magnified a paper, uh, a figure from the paper to show the ratio uh, of uh, black or Hispanic mortality rates to the white mortality rate uh, for infants with congenital heart disease. You can see that uh, the ratio for uh, black infants has increased from 1.28 times the white mortality rate to one and a half times. And similarly for Hispanic infants, it has increased uh, from one times the white mortality rate to one and a quarter uh, times that rate. Uh, I'll let the authors again speak for themselves. Although race and ethnicity uh, have um, uh, shown uh, reductions in congenital heart disease specific mortality uh, rates for uh, black and Hispanic infants. Uh, however, black infants experienced the highest mortality rate attributable to congenital heart disease, followed by Hispanics. These differences in temporal trends have resulted in mortality rate ratios for non-Hispanic Blacks uh, and Hispanics that reflect slightly worsening disparities in congenital heart disease specific mortality. Now here's the last paper from my area. It comes from the AHRQ Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project data, which measured the odds of a child with in-hospital complications after cardiac surgery being rescued. ARC defines failure to rescue as the inability to prevent death after the development of a complication. Uh, the data come from over 3 million pediatric discharge abstracts. And because of small numbers, Native American and multiracial children are grouped under the other race category. 
I quote from the paper, black children, children on Medicaid and children of other race and ethnicity had an increased odds of failure to rescue when compared with white children. So you might ask, what do the data on disparities in my field of cardiac critical care have to do with the training environment and with healthcare systems? The ACGME issues an annual report on the clinical learning environment for residents and fellows in the United States. This is the so-called CLEAR report. It is the closest thing we have to a real-time snapshot of the status of resident and fellowship training. The most recent report was from 2022 and covered nearly 4,600 training programs and 49,000 trainees and 287 training programs, of which nine were children's hospitals. As part of the CLEAR methodology, the reviewers meet with institutional leadership on a variety of issues, one of which is to assess uh, whether there are institutional strategies to address healthcare and outcomes disparities. You can see the results here. 87% of institutions have no approach to variability in care. 11% are in the early stages of developing a systematic approach, and only 1.8% of institutions have a systematic approach now. We should all spend a few seconds allowing these results to sink in. Variability in care is a reality in every field, not just cardiac critical care. And the vast majority of institutions in the United States where trainees are taught and enculturated do not have a systematic approach to healthcare disparities. We should ask ourselves why these results exist after decades of research documenting healthcare disparities. I believe that if institutions, if pediatric organizations, and if all of us collectively as a profession were to apply the same methods to equity that have worked for patient safety, this graphic would look different. We'll turn now to the mental health crisis. I'm not going to show you any slides documenting that there's a crisis in mental health. I think you all accept that. Uh, my focus today is going to be on the workforce component uh, of this crisis. The data on this slide illustrate uh, the current and projected future shortages in the traditional child mental health workforce. Over on the right, you can see the HRSA models uh, for severe shortages in child psychiatry uh, over the next day, decade under any plausible scenario. And here on the left, you can see the ratio of school psychologists or school counselors to students. And that ratio is only about half of the recommended uh, um, uh, professional to student uh, ratio. The upshot uh, is that the demands uh, on primary care pediatricians to manage common behavioral and mental health problems will grow. Now, before I get into uh, some data on our competencies as pediatricians in behavioral and mental health, I just wanna make sure we're all grounded in a couple of definitions. First on competency-based medical education or CBME. This is a physician uh, education that uh, analyzes societal and patient needs. It's important to fixate that in your minds. We start with the patient when talking about uh, what it is we need to learn. And it is organized around outcomes uh, and it is uh, dedicated to developing competencies. It de-emphasizes time-based training, recognizing that the acquisition of competencies uh, happens at uh, variable rates in the trainee. Entrustable professional activities are an assessment approach based on the essential tasks of a discipline 
that an individual can be trusted to perform without supervision. Uh, the entrustment comes from the faculty and the training program, but I think most importantly from the parents of the child. Uh, and these occur in a given context. So now let's look at how we're doing in this regard. These data are uh, from a prospective cohort study um, spearheaded by Dan Schumacher, and uh, it involved 23 pediatric residency programs participating in the Association of Pediatric Program Directors Learn Network. Uh, the assessments of resident competencies were uh, performed by the respective training programs, clinical competency committee. And we'll start off with newborn care, and you'll notice that essentially all residents are competent in newborn care by the time they graduate. Conversely, uh, there were four EPAs where at least 30%, 30%, of graduating residents in our training programs were judged not to have achieved a level of competency consistent with unsupervised practice. These were transition to adult care, provide consultation, practice management, and behavioral and mental health. And among these EPAs, behavioral and mental health, EPA number nine, stood out as the area uh, where only approximately half of graduating residents could be judged competent for unsupervised practice. This pattern of a large number of residents finishing training without attaining competency in behavioral and mental health for common pediatric mental health problems has been noted for at least 40 years. Now, having taken a look at the preparation of general pediatrics residents, now let's look at how prepared pediatric fellows are to manage mental health concerns. These data come from a survey of fellows taking the 2020 ABP in training exam. The gold columns reflect the percent of fellows who felt a specialist in their field should be responsible for addressing emotional and mental health concerns uh, of the patients and families. The gray columns reflect the percent of fellows in each subspecialty who felt competent to actually do so. Now, a few findings I'll share with you here. Except for neonatology, a majority of fellows felt subspecialists in their field bore some responsibility for mental health care to families and patients with chronic conditions. Although not shown um, uh, in uh, these data, uh, there was um, a pronounced trend towards that percentage expressing a sense of responsibility to decrease as resident, I'm sorry, as fellows advanced in training to the second and third years of fellowship. Now, next uh, finding. On average, only 24% of fellows reported feeling competent uh, in providing some behavioral and mental health support to families and children in their fields. Only adolescent medicine here over on the uh, left uh, had more than 50% of fellows reporting competence uh, in mental health. And in the spirit of uh, taking my share of the responsibility, we'll take a look at critical care medicine over on the right, uh, where I point to the fact that only 13% of fellows reported competence in uh, mental health care, despite 63% of PICU fellows acknowledging our responsibility for such care. Now let's dive more into the PICU world here, keeping in mind that only 13% of PICU fellows in 2020 felt competent in mental health care. This slide is designed to show why a PICU training program might want to develop such competencies. The data on the slide come from a variety of sources uh, and they show the prevalence of post-traumatic stress syndrome among patients and families passing through our PICUs and ORs. 
On the far right, you can see that 25% of PICU survivors are left with PTSD, one out of four. Uh, similarly, 23% of mothers of PICU patients emerge with PTSD. The rate among fathers is estimated at 11%. Now, uh, in contrast, the PTSD prevalence in the uh, population of American children is 8%. It doubles to 16% amongst children with complex chronic illnesses. Now, by way of further assumption of my share of the responsibility, I wrote an editorial in Pediatric Critical Care Medicine in 2004 uh, in response uh, to one of the early papers on PTSD among PICU survivors it was entitled The PICU Nightmare. The riddle at the time was exactly why the prevalence of PTSD is so high among PICU survivors. And in the editorial, I postulated three potential causes, inadequate sedation during invasive and, and potentially painful procedures, uh, harmful effects of the drugs themselves, particularly the sedation drugs, and then failure to develop systems of care uh, for families and, and patients during, but especially after the PICU admission. Now, it is known, uh, it wasn't known then, but it is known now that early recall of delusional memories is a risk factor for PTSD. And similarly, patients who are uh, more awake uh, during mechanical ventilation are least likely to suffer PTSD. Now on the slide, you can see one of the critical insights uh, that uh, has developed and it shows a linear relationship uh, here between benzodiazepine exposure and delirium in the day following the exposure. Hence, we now uh, recognize that intensivists can modify the patient's mental health by choice of sedation, especially exposure to benzodiazepines. Uh, there are many other factors that are important as well, but this is one of the modifiable um, factors. And this has led to a quality improvement bundle known as ICU liberation, which involves the entire uh, ICU team in liberating a child uh, from the environmental and pharmacological constraints of ICU care. And it goes beyond benzodiazepines to involve managing noise, um, the uh, ambient light schedule, the physical restraints, early mobilization, and much more, even in intubated patients and patients on ECMO. Uh, and uh, I postulate on the bottom here that a QI bundle uh, can move um, beyond just a QI project to involve systems change and indeed a change in culture. Now we're going to uh, end um, my part of the presentation with solutions, act three. And uh, by way of my second disclaimer uh, for this morning, uh, I am the first to acknowledge that healthcare disparities uh, and the mental health crisis are complex, multifactorial, uh, and difficult to manage, uh, phenomena. They will require multifaceted solutions, for sure. While advocating for societal changes, for today's discussion, I argue that we have a professional obligation to address those components of these two complex problems that we have some control over, namely the quality of our care and the quality of our training. We already have the tools in quality improvement science and in competency-based medical education. However, these tools will only affect outcomes if they are embedded in systems and in institutional culture. The last step requires active support of CEOs, presidents, and boards of directors. All right, a little bit of detail. Act one, uh, part one of act three, the disparities. 
Uh, in the last 20 years, there have been about 3,000 papers published on healthcare disparities in children, 3,000. Uh, I've been able to find two papers that I consider credible in showing actual solutions. I'm going to show you both. This one is from Neonatology. Uh, these are the results here of a decade-long quality improvement effort of the Vermont Oxford Network, which at the time included uh, close to 800 NICUs and 200,000 premature infants. Displayed here are the differences in premature infant mortality rate among African-American and Hispanic versus white infants by birth year. The dashed red line is the reference point for white infants. The pink and teal colored lines with shaded confidence intervals reflect respectively the African-American and Hispanic mortality rate differences compared to white infants. You can see the differences have shrunk considerably over the past uh, decade. This is decidedly different uh, than the pattern I showed you for my area, cardiac critical care and congenital heart disease. This did not happen by accident. How did they do this? First, there was a public commitment of the network leadership and the member institutions to eliminate disparities in premature infant outcomes. Second, they deconstructed the individual care steps and intermediate outcomes um, from the delivery room to discharge from the NICU. This is what you see on the left-hand side of this graph, and it uh, reflects the um, various uh, intermediate steps. They are not important for today's uh, discussion, but uh, know that the methodology was successful in achieving this outcome. Um, they involved parents in asking what is a potential cause of a disparity, and then what can we do about it? And then they uh, designed improvement cycles and tested uh, improvement cycles to overcome the disparities. Not every improvement cycle worked. Here's the second example I'm going to show you. Uh, this one comes from pediatric oncology. The data are from a recently published secondary analysis of eight children's oncology group clinical trials involving over 21,000 children and young adults uh, from the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The authors performed a multivariate Cox proportional hazard analysis to determine the effect uh, uh, on event-free survival of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and disease prognosticators. Uh, the various disease prognosticators are listed on the bottom of the slide. The vertical black line represents the reference group of non-Hispanic white patients. And again, because of small numbers, uh, indigenous populations are grouped under the other category. The wine-colored circles show the increased risk of an event such as uh, a relapse or a death during remission among Black, Hispanic, and other patients. Uh, Asian patients here over at the top um, were not at increased risk for a disparate outcome. Now, once a socioeconomic status and disease prognosticators are accounted for in the aqua circles, the increased risk amongst Hispanic uh, patients is largely attenuated, but not for uh, Black patients. Now, here comes the surprise. This is the analysis performed only on the T-cell leukemia patient population. And note that none of the patient groups showed an increased risk for a disparate outcome. Uh, hence, the disparities were only in B-cell leukemia patients. Um, B-cell and T-cell leukemia are treated in the same institutions, for the most part by the same people. And yet, it was possible for one of these disease categories to achieve uh, equity. Now, the authors in this paper go on to speculate on the reasons for the differences. And again, for today's discussion, uh, I will perhaps leave that uh, to the oncologists in the room. 
but the generalizable points for us today are in the rigor uh, of the uh, adjustments in the multivariate models, the detailed subgroup analyses, and most especially in the uh, success in showing that it is possible to overcome disparities. It is possible to have um, equitable care and equitable outcomes uh, in carefully managed, carefully supervised, uh, protocolized uh, care. I hope this can be replicated in other areas. All of these uh, examples or both of these examples occur in the concept or within the concept of a learning healthcare system and a learning uh, network. Um, this is not a new concept. The National Academy uh, published this report in 2007 and has encouraged us to adopt this model uh, for uh, our healthcare systems. This graphic is designed to just emphasize the components of uh, a network, a learning network. On the right-hand side, you can see the operational core, which houses the improvement leadership, the IT platform, the data registry and analytics and so forth. And on the left-hand side, uh, it's the clinically integrated systems like this that have to carry out the actual bedside care. You can notice uh, the bi-directional flow of information uh, between these two entities. And I, uh, again, emphasize the role of leadership that must um, incorporate uh, these components into systems and into the culture of the institution. Now we'll end up uh, with uh, mental health. These are uh, images from a youth mental health summit uh, sponsored by the Annie Casey Foundation and the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General, which I attended in April. It was amazing to see how the youth at the high school and college level are not waiting for us to get organized. They are organizing for systems transformation, for advocacy, and for peer support. In the center of gravity uh, at the federal and state level, uh, for funding anyway, is shifting towards the schools. I feel one of our assignments is to figure out how we can support these young people. Uh, last year, the Kaiser Family Foundation issued a report on school-based mental health, and I'm going to just uh, highlight two issues. Um, Relevant for today's discussion is that 66% of public schools rely on external referrals for mental health services, and 17% of public schools already use telehealth to deliver mental health services. How are our training programs responding uh, to these developments? Well, one response is uh, setting expectations. This is the expectation in EPA number nine. And one of the competencies that is in this EPA is to coordinate an interprofessional team to ensure inclusion of mental health specialists, school and community resources, and support groups. And the data on this slide uh, come uh, from, again, another study that uh, we sponsored from the board to show the uh, impact uh, of uh, co-located or integrated professionals in behavioral and mental health in continuity clinics. And the goal here um, for me showing this slide is to show that both co-location and integration uh, of mental health professionals lead to uh, greater self-reported confidence among those uh, residents who were in those types of continuity clinics compared to a control group of uh, residents who did not have that type of continuity clinical model. Uh, back to the subspecialists. Um, as a subspecialist, I know uh, how difficult and how daunting it can appear to take on mental health, but parents and young adult patients want us to do this. This is Meg Didier, uh, who was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and is now a powerful advocate for uh, mental health uh, amongst complex chronically ill patients. She's giving a talk here at Cincinnati Children's and I'm just going to quote her vision for the Roadmap Project, which is 
one of the American Board of Pediatrics projects in this area. We celebrate that every individual with a chronic condition and their family is asked about their emotional health, feels acknowledged about their stress, and is connected to needed supports. Every individual, every visit, every time. Uh, there are resources available. Um, you're not alone in the roadmap project or in the challenge of trying to address family mental health needs. I included this slide to show you a really substantial compendium of resources that you can use. And I believe a number of the subspecialty programs here uh, at Stanford are also engaged in the roadmap project. So we'll end where we started with Abraham Jacoby. Every generation of pediatricians has faced its set of crises. Ours are no greater uh, than the early ones of the Jacoby years uh, and the then life-threatening, now chronic diseases of the middle years. We have the tools in learning networks, learning healthcare systems to do our part in overcoming our profession's crises in this current era. However, to do so, to achieve improved outcomes, we will require the commitments of leadership of our CEOs, our presidents, and our boards with the very same intensity that Abraham Jacoby evidenced all the way back in 1861. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Leonard. Thank you. So as I look around the room, I can think of so many people that I know are so grateful for your remarks and will have questions. So we're going to start with Dr. Anand in the back. Yes. Hi, Dave. Um, great talk, as always. Um, I, I had uh, sort of two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, f the critical care group uh, is part of a rapid response team for any change in physical health. Are there places where there could be a similar rapid response team for changes in mental health or behavioral, relational, social health? It's a great question. I, I don't know of any, but it's a great question. I think the ability to uh, access resources in a, at least in a timely fashion, I, I mean, I think a rapid response that may even be beyond what our systems are capable of now, but if it could be timely, uh, that would be a huge advance. And when you talk to the parents, they, at this point, you know, they, they know how our systems work. They're, they're in and out of our hospitals all the time, the, the parents of chronically ill children. At this point, they just want to be acknowledged. They just want someone to say, yes, we know how hard it is to do what you're doing uh, as a parent. And, and I'm, I'm willing to help you find somebody to address your stress. If we could get to that point, that would be a step in the right direction. The, the other comment I wanted to make is uh, uh, there's one more study you can ar add to your armamentarium where we had uh, noticed a threefold higher mortality amongst PICU patients in uh, a previous hospital where I worked at and did a multi-level healthcare delivery intervention, which brought that down within uh, within 12 months of finding this uh, disparity. So I'll, I'll uh, send that over to you. I, I am, I'm aware of that study. <laughs> and um, let me just say that in the, so the, the issue with that um, uh, is the, the question that has come up in the oncology world about patient selection. And I left that out because I know there's a controversy about, and that controversy is actually addressed in the paper that I am citing here. So, you know, perhaps if there are oncologists in the, in the group, they can add to that discussion, but there is some debate about that. Dr. Nichols, another great presentation. Um, one of the challenges for academic centers is that they have a very diverse population, both in languages and culture. So when we think about how do we deal with mental health, while the, 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 the uh, children can probably speak English, many of the families may not, and may yes. have different culture. So the, you know, how do we as pediatricians and, and people that are training the next generation deal with that issue? Uh, I, <laughs> 
you you always ask the tough questions, Dr. Mendoza. I wish I had an easy answer. So, you know, on one level, I would say that anyone going into medicine today should be bilingual uh, and should have the ability to communicate in at least one more commonly spoken language in the United States. Now, for those of us who are older who didn't learn a second language that is commonly spoken in the United States, uh, I think we are um, dependent on translation and the systems have to develop in a way to make translation readily accessible, quickly accessible, and not just you know person to person translation, but in our signage, in our, in our websites, in our uh, um, handouts, and you know, all the various tools. And hopefully teams, and as we think about like who's on our team and how do we build a team, we will include people with the language skills to supplement deficiencies if we have them ourselves. Um, All I, right, so I am gonna ask a question from an oncologist. Um, so you argue that commitment by hospital and academic leaders, CEOs, boards, et cetera, is needed to drive change. But despite evidence of these problems for many years, these leaders have not created the change needed. What steps do you think are needed to move these leaders towards action? <laughs> Makes Fernando's question look easy, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, um, you know, having been a CEO myself, I can I can say that um, CEOs are responding to a vast array of issues, uh, and you know the issue is like what are the ones that are going to determine survival of the institution? What are the ones that are the most important for me to spend my time on? So for CEOs, typically it's money. Like you run out of money, this institution's gonna die. It is accreditation, uh, recognition, recognition from the external bodies that say you're a legitimate institution. Uh, and, um, you know, for some uh, institutions, um, I, I would say it's also support from your local communities. Now we have to get equity up into that group of things that CEOs and boards, it's not just the CEOs, it's the boards too, believe is essential for their future and, and not to wait until it's too late. So I'll, I'll, I'll give an analogy. Uh, quite, a, quite a few members of my family are in law enforcement uh, and there is an existential crisis going on in law enforcement now uh, where communities, large segments of communities don't trust law enforcement uh, and, and make it obvious that they do not trust law enforcement. I would argue that where law enforcement has ended up today, that was preventable 30 years ago. Had, had the leadership um, responsible for training and acculturation adopted a different approach, uh, an approach that um, allowed communities to engender and develop and cultivate trust. Instead, mass incarceration was chosen as the path. Uh, and and we're, we're at a similar defining point where, where we have to decide what direction are we gonna go in as a profession? And how do we embrace our parents, our public, our communities to join with us? And, and CEOs have, have to see this as perhaps not the burning platform for today, but it will be in the future if we do not really get on this right now. So that's the best I can do in response to this question. Dr. Nichols. Hi, Carrie Rosbach here. I am the oh, yeah. Pediatrics Residency Program Director, and thank you. That was a very informative discussion. Um, I'm interested in the first, one of the earlier slides where you showed the percent of um, healthcare expenditures and the mortality. And I'm curious if you could reflect a little bit on the, the amount of money that goes into children's health compared to just healthcare expenses in general in the US and also how that might impact the pipeline of folks going into pediatrics because I've 
I see the data that we're having to work harder to recruit top applicants into pediatrics. And uh, there's a lot of barriers to people entering our field. And I think it's resulting in um, disparities in primary care access in certain areas, as well as in certain pediatric subspecialties. Right. Uh, well, I think you're uh, alluding to a well-known problem in the United States that uh, the investment in children is um, inadequate uh, and uh, profoundly lags behind the investment in children in other countries. It's true on the healthcare side, it's true on the education side. Um, if you miss these first few years of good nutrition, safe environment, healthy families, uh, you're not going to have a doctor at the other end, and you're pointing this out. Uh, we have this um, handicap that, again, is beyond what I can address today and what we can solve today, except as citizens, perhaps, uh, and going out and advocating and voting. But children are not on the list of priorities for the United States of America when it comes to dispensing dollars. Uh, and I'm hoping that this changes uh, in the future, but the impact on our profession is profound. So we've had a lot of other great questions. I'm Oh, Neville, I just I have to give an out the chief of adolescent medicine the chance oh, yeah. to ask a question. <laughs> and then, and then the, we'll close. With the Dr. Question. Nichols, thank you for that very eloquent presentation. I'm happy to see that our trainees are one of the highest rating incompetencies in behavioral management. Um, but I have to say our profession has actually been slammed over the past, especially during the, the past pandemic. And um, the mental health crisis really disproportionately affects minority populations, as you know, and also those with public insurance. And, and so we identify the cases, we do what we can, but there aren't the resources to help. We don't have the mental health physicians or professionals in our clinics, although they're very good studies that show that this is a way to go. So how, how do we deal with that? It's the same as the question before, but it's not only the CEOs, it's also the CEOs of, of companies, of insurance companies, yeah. such as Medicaid. Yeah. Um, well, it has to be a multifaceted approach, uh, I would say. Um, we'll have to uh, begin to partner with many different institutions to try and address this. I tried to highlight the school system as a venue where dollars are beginning to flow into the school systems. In, in, in states that typically don't actually fund children. So this, this um, mental health summit that I was at was, was held in Georgia. And we had legislators from Georgia and from Alabama uh, come and speak uh, there. And, and they were focused on mental health in the school system. And they were, these uh, were uh, otherwise conservative members of their state legislatures. And they were promoting uh, the investment in mental health. So this is an area where I think the tide is perhaps turning and where you can look to that source of dollars. The insurance companies, they have to be persuaded that you keep kids out of emergency rooms if you can help them you know, find a resource for mental health. You'll save money in the long run. And then lastly, we all have to develop some skills in this area. We're not going to be able to point to a mental health professional. We are going to have to become better at this, particularly primary care pediatricians. Thank you. So I, I'll just make two comments in closing. One is local and one is national. So we're working very closely with the School of Education. We're really trying to codify and strengthen those partnerships with joint faculty appointments. There's a new center for the early child um, and Lisa Chamberlain and Ryan Pedrez are co-directors of the center. So there'll be much, much more about the opportunities for the school. Mark Del Monte, who's the CEO and president of the American Academy of Pediatrics is helping educate us a lot about Medi-Cal dollars and what goes to the school systems. On the national level, building on many of the themes we've heard about 
about and, and Carrie, your point about the pediatric subspecialty worst for us. So Dr. Nichols referenced some other National Academy of Science um, reports like the Learning Health System. Um, a group of us uh, generated the funding and, and went to the National Academy and asked them to do one of their reports on the pediatric subspecialty workforce. Becky Blankenberg and myself were part of a, this much bigger effort. Um, you know, and with Lisa Chamberlain, who's a member of the Pediatric Policy Council, and many of us who have different advocacy roles, um, I think the department along, and also the Children's Hospital Association, so speaking of the CEOs, helped sponsor this report. So I think it's really exciting that this is coming out, and it's a real call to action for all of us. So we'll have to come together and think about how we're going to really amplify that message. And one of the things we asked very early on is what are the data that when a child is taken care of by an adult subspecialist and not a pediatric subspecialist, they do worse. And we asked the Council of Pediatric Subspecialties to investigate that literature and publish a paper, and that's been done as well. So lots more conversations around the pediatric subspecialty workforce. So, all right, thank you, Dr. Nichols. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.